I spend time with the Lord in the morning. I, when I get up, I have this rocking chair that I love. It's a glider. <laughs> and I just make my coffee and I sit in the living room. Sometimes John's there, sometimes he's not. And I meet with the Lord. You know, he has a time where he wants to meet with you. When my kids were little, it used to be at night after they went to bed because if I tried to do it in the morning, they would eat my Bible pages. And I kept all my Bibles, and they have all these pages missing because they'd grab the page of the Bible while I was trying to read it. But um, it's in the morning now, and I just feel the presence of God enveloping me as I begin to read the Word. So uh, in November, maybe mid-December, maybe it was mid-December, I began to talk to the Lord uh, and ask him, what he was saying to me about this new season that we're entering into. And he said, Cheryl, he said, I'm getting ready to further remove the veil that came on you from Mount Sinai. And I thought, wow, really? What's that all about? And uh, so I looked it up. So I want you to turn with me to Exodus 20 verses 18 through 21. Because I believe as we come into this new season, this is one of the new things that God is doing for us. I don't know. I think this is the NIV, but I'm not sure. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled in fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. We do not, but do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. He's just coming this way to test you so that his fear will rest on you and keep you from sinning in the future. The people remained at a distance, though. While Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Now, what I understood from reading this scripture was, just as God had come into the garden to meet with Adam and Eve, to have a personal relationship with them, so that they would hear his voice, sense his presence, feel his love, and yet... They listened to another voice and lost that ability. You know, they didn't have to wear clothes because the presence of God was so on them. They were covered with his glory. And we see that where Moses would go up to the mountain and he would come down and, and what would be happening? His face would be glowing with that same glory. Now it would dissipate, but when he would go up again, it would happen again. And so God came back at this instance in, in Mount Sinai and he was speaking to every individual in that Israeli camp. And he was saying, I want to speak to you. Yes. And they said, no. Moses, you listen to him and tell us what he said. And I want to say something. From that day forward, religion got a grip Religion got a grip, and men and women no longer felt uh, capable of hearing God themselves. Wow. Now, in God's graciousness, he sent prophets, and the Spirit of God would come upon those prophets, and they would be, be able to give the word of the Lord. But that was not the original intent. The original intent in the garden and then the new dispensation that was happening when they, when they were coming out of Egypt and into the promised land, that wasn't the original intent for one person to hear him. He wants an individual, personal, powerful, unique relationship with each one of you and me. And never should someone else's hearing God take the place of you having that relationship. 
He's a God of intimacy. And he desires that with each one of us. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but this is a new day. God is saying you need to awaken to this. Listen, people in religion have not even been permitted to read the Bible. Only the higher-ups could read it and tell you what they thought it meant. It's never stopped. But God's removing that veil today. And where is the veil? It's here. It's here. You know, our mind, our heart, and our conscience, they're all the same thing. They can be interchanged. And God wants to speak to us personally. So what did he do? The next new thing. He sent his son. Now, there had been 400 years of absolute silence. No one had been able to hear God speak. Not even Bible verses written during that time. And into the picture comes the next new thing. God's next Try out for us. Are we going to hear his express image that he sent into the earth realm to cause us to have a personal relationship with him? So, I began to study the Gospels. You know, when you hear a word like this, you, you, we all see in part, the scripture says, And I began to study the Gospels. I've been studying them for weeks now and weeks. And I began to look at the life of Jesus to see how he he had a relationship with the Father. How he had that intimacy. How, listen, the Bible says he didn't say anything unless he heard the Father say it. He didn't do anything unless he saw the Father do it. From day one, he was an example to the disciples that he chose and to his family members and to the people on the street. He he just modeled that intimate relationship. He would go away and be with God. And when he would go away and be with God, his Father, he would hear him. And then he'd come back down and he'd do what he heard. And it was proof that he had heard the voice of God. When John the Baptist baptized him, he'd been looking for the Lamb of God. And when Jesus came up out of the water, we've said this here before, heaven opened. And for the first time in, in 400 years, God spoke. God the Father from heaven, and somebody heard him. John the Baptist, Jesus. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, in whom I have put all of my favor. And he came up out of that water and was driven into the wilderness where he had to uh, war and contend with a false voice. And he did it through the word of God. Listen, as we read the word of God on a daily basis, as we sit quietly and listen for him to speak to us, my time with the Lord is not me petitioning him and praying continually. Most of the, my time with the Lord is quiet. I want to say the Christian disciplines probably that I do the most are meditating on the word of God and listening to his voice, or for his voice. I do the other ones too, but we have to be a people where that, that voice can come in and it softens our heart. Didn't, didn't he say, harden not your hearts like they did in the wilderness because they did not hear what I had to say? All, and then you go down through Revelations, and it says, hear what the Spirit is saying to you, to all the seven churches. In Hebrews, Paul says, harden not your hearts. 
as they did in the day of provocation in their unbelief. But what was their unbelief? They weren't listening to the voice that was speaking. They rejected it. So I studied the Gospels, and I saw how Jesus began to uh, just show everybody that intimate relationship. He, he had that relationship with the disciples as he chose them. You know, we have no authority in anybody's life outside of the relationship we have with them. You don't have authority. You can't, you can't walk up to somebody, really, and in any type of authority give them a prophetic word if there's not some type of relationship. Oh, well, I won't go there. <laughs> it was never about religion from day one, ever. It was always about relationship. We created religion, really. You know, when Jesus showed up as the second chance, the last Adam, I guess I should say, not only were there 10 commandments, but many of the commentaries say there were 613 added rules and regulations. Who could keep that? We couldn't even keep the 10. Jesus, in his mercy, shrunk the 10 down to two. Love me with all your heart and your neighbor is yourself. We couldn't even keep the ten. He thought, if I can get these people to do just these two, all the other ones will fall into place with that. But can you imagine 613 added rules and regulations? They had Pharisees, Sadducees, and Levites stationed at different places all over Jerusalem and Israel, especially on the Sabbath, making sure that those 613 plus the 10 were not broken. And if they were broken, you, will, you were brought before the council. And you were, you were excommunicated from the synagogue because you didn't keep the rules. And God was saying the whole time, it's not about the rules. It's about relationship. And Jesus modeled that. He modeled it with the lepers because he touched them. He modeled it with the adulteress because he didn't stone her. He modeled it because he allowed women to work with him on his team. He modeled it with the sinners. He modeled it by breaking the Sabbath because, he said... Man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man, or I might have had it different. I don't, I'm, I forget how it goes, but you know what I'm saying. It was a day for us. It was made for us so that we could uh, communicate and fellowship with God Almighty and one another. Jesus modeled and he said, listen, you guys, love each other. Love your neighbor. Do good to each other. You know, there's all this talk about ascension now. This is the year of ascension. Yes, it is. But we don't ascend to become famous or arrogant. We ascend to descend to become the servant, to, to wash one another's feet because they will know who Christ is by our love. So I studied the scripture, and God said to me, the, the Gospels, and he said, this was my example to you. This was the new. I mean, he, Jesus even embraced the hungry Pharisees and loved them. Now, he called some of them snakes and vipers. You know, he, he didn't pull punches. You know, he, 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 just, he just had to, he had to make it real. He had to make it real. How did we make it? How did we get to where it was so unreal? Where no one could approach God unless you go through me. How did we get there? Do you realize that that religious structure when Christ came became so brittle? That wineskin became so brittle that in 70 AD it was totally wiped out. Priestly Judaism ended in 70 AD because it was corrupt, 
It was brittle, and it no longer heard God. You cannot pour new wine into an old wineskin. We now have rabbinical Judaism, but it's totally different than priestly Judaism. And I want to say, I think the Christian church has become very much like in many aspects where we have left off training people, training new disciples to hear God themselves. I know, I know Peter and Tricia and the leaders here teach you about an intimate relationship with the Lord. Because really, you can come to church all of your life. You can work at the food pantry. You can do all these wonderful things. But none of it takes the place of an intimate, personal relationship with God. It has nothing to do about going to church. Now, do we need to, does the Bible say, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together? Absolutely. We're supposed to be in fellowship one with, the, one with another. Jesus lived with the disciples. They argued about who was going to be the greatest on the way when he was going to be uh, crucified, you know, before he got into Jerusalem. They're fighting over who's going to be the greatest. He wasn't blind to any of that. He knows how we are. And he was saying, guys, you've got to get this right. You've got to realize that it's the servanthood of Christ, of me, that is going to be released into the world so that people feel the love and the desire that I have for them to come into my family. Yes. Why do you think Jesus was so excited when Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. It was because Peter heard God speak. He said, Peter, he said, you've heard this from the Father. You didn't get this on your own. Jesus was excited because I think he was like, yeah, they're getting it. It's about hearing my Father. How many times do I have to say to them every day, I don't do it unless I hear the Father tell me to do it. I hope you're getting something out of this. So I continued reading, and I got to Mark chapter 9. I want you to turn there with me. I'm reading out of the Passion Translation. That's my Bible this year. Last year I read the NIV, and I read the... Um, chronological Bible, it was so amazing for me to read, that, uh, read through that Bible, the entire Bible, in a chronological order. I think I mentioned it here because it's, it showed me the redemptive plan of salvation in a way I had never seen it before. I had a new perspective. This is a new perspective for us today. It's old things, but God's saying something new to us. So I got to Mark chapter 9. Let's read it. Uh, verse, verses 1 through, oh, let's see. Verses 1 through 8. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. There are some standing here now who won't experience death until they see God's kingdom realm manifest with power. And my message today is called A New Kingdom Perspective. After six days, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, Jacob and John, James and John, and hiked up a mountain to be alone. And Jesus' appearance was dramatically altered, for he was transfigured before their very eyes. His clothing sparkled and became glistening white, whiter than any bleach in the world could make them. Then suddenly, right in front of them, Moses and Elijah appeared, and they spake with Jesus. Peter blurted out, good teacher, this is so amazing to see the three of you together. Why don't we stay here and set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah? For all of the disciples were in total fear, and Peter didn't have a clue what to say. But he said something. Just then, a radiant cloud began to spread over them, enveloping them all, even Peter, James, and John. And God's voice suddenly spoke from the cloud, 
saying, this is my beloved son, and you need to always listen to him. Then suddenly, as they looked around, they saw only Jesus with them, for Moses and Elijah had faded away. So I was, as I was sitting in my rocking chair, it was like the Lord was sitting in the sofa right next to me. And his voice spoke like I am speaking to you. And he said, this was the redo of Sinai. I, I'm anointed saying it to you because I'm 67 years old. I have never heard that preached. Now, I'm not saying it was never preached by somebody somewhere. I have never heard that preached. Just like Peter said, Jesus came and redid some things, gave it, an, gave it another chance. This was a redo of Sinai. And isn't it interesting that Moses and Elijah met with Jesus, whom they had prophesied of. The law and the prophets, and they got to stand with him on that mountain in his glory to see that the prophetic words they had given had finally been manifested. Peter, James, and John heard the voice of the Father as they were surrounded in this glory cloud. And God was saying to him, yes, this is my express image. The creator of the universe. This is what I want from you. Continually hear him. Don't say no like you did at Sinai. Don't say no like you did in the Garden of Eden. Hear him now on a daily basis and use the intimate relationship that he has modeled with you to continually hear that voice. Why? Because it will put a fear of God in us so that we will no longer keep sinning. It was never about... Peter wanted to build three booths. He wanted to right away make it a religion. Shrine them up. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Now, now. So I thought I was going to fall out of my rocking chair. First of all, because... When you hear God's voice like that, you know he's right there with you and you think, I think I'm going to die. <laughs> what was I thinking about before this? <laughs> what have I done wrong? Um, but he's so there for us. This is a, this, we're in a new, just, we're, this, this is another new day. <laughs> Let's not harden our hearts like we did in the wilderness through our unbelief. So, interestingly enough, you know, Easter, when you gave that scripture this morning in Psalm 29, how the voice of the Lord, I mean, this was so God today that you gave that scripture. But the verse, the one verse says, he breaks the wilderness of our Kadesh. Our Kadesh. That means the wilderness of our wanderings. What did, what did Israel do in the wilderness? They wandered. Why did they wander? Because they rejected the ability to hear the voice themselves. Kingdom has a government. I'm not saying that in hearing God ourselves, for ourselves every day, that we reject the government of God when we come into the corporate fellowship that God has placed us in. Because in that kingdom fellowship, there's a kingdom government for a purpose. Apostles, uh, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Just because we are hearing God ourselves does not mean we are independent of the government of God that he has placed in our midst to keep us safe, to keep us governed. 
But you can go to those places, and if you've not heard God yourself, it's not going to do you any good. It's, it's a twofold thing here we have to get because independence, because you think you're hearing God, is a sin. We're to, we're to submit to one another. We're to uh, counsel with one another. I mean, when I heard this word for the first time in my life in 67 years, I checked it out with my apostle before I dared preach it. I said, is this kosher? I used a Jewish word. And he said, yes. We have to be submitted one to another. It doesn't matter how great the revelation is you get or how great the spiritual experience is. Now let me just take you to one last bit of the scripture that I've read all my life and never put it together with this. And that is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 19. I, I mean, I am just shocked. We read this word every day and it comes alive. It's not dead. It's not dead. It penetrates us. It creates new life, new fruit in us. We will be awesome fruit bearers if we stay in the place of intimacy with the Lord. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 19. And this is Peter talking about his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. We were not retelling some masterfully create, crafted legend when we informed you of the power and appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we saw his magnificence and splendor unveiled before our eyes. And the Lord had said, I'm getting ready to remove the veil again in a greater way. That's what he had said to me. I have never seen this in Peter in my life. I, am, I read it, but I've never seen it. <laughs> yes, Father God lavished upon him radiant glory and honor when his distinct voice spoke out of the realm of majestic glory, endorsing him with these words, This is my cherished son, marked by my love. All my delight is found in him. And we ourselves heard that voice resound from the heavens while we were with him on the holy mountain. Raise your hands and say, I'm part of that prophetic troop. Now, when Christ was crucified, we all know the veil was rent in two between the holy place and the holy of holies from the top to the bottom. That was a commencement. It was the beginning of what was released into the earth for all of us. Because actually we were in the loins of the apostles of the beginning church. You get what I'm saying. Yeah. And Jesus sent them. As the, as the Father has sent me, he said, so send I you. What did he send them to do? Continue the unveiling. Continue the unveiling so that they see my love for them. So they see my desire for intimate relationship with them. So their fruit may abound. So they can have an abundant life greater than they could ever imagine in this earth realm. So that they can appropriate all of my promises that are yes and amen to all of them so that they can hear my voice continually, that the veil never covers over them anymore where they think they're not able to hear me or I don't want them to hear me. They won't listen to the voice of the enemy saying, oh, there's a better voice out there. How many voices are out there right now? I'm going to read one more thing to you. Luke eleven thirty three. 33 through 36. And it's about Revelation light. 
No one would think of lighting a lamp and then hiding it in the basement where no one would benefit. Don't hide our, let's not hide our lamps. <laughs> a lamp belongs on a lampstand where all who enter may see its light. The eyes of your spirit allow revelation light to enter into your being. When your heart is open, the light floods in. But when your heart is hard and closed, the light cannot penetrate and darkness takes its place. That's religion. That's sin. That's unbelief. It's not what God has for us. Open your heart and consider my words. Now listen to this. Watch out that you don't mistake your opinions for revelation light. The only way that we cannot make that mistake is by hearing God's voice on a daily basis. There are so many opinions out there right now. There are so many voices. And if we are walking with God, hearing that voice, our lamp is lit. And any darkness that tries to come in, it may, it can, listen, the devil sounded good. And Eve bit that apple. And what's out there today sounds so good. I was telling Peter and Tricia last night, you know, Chuck had given a word about in the next several months, we're going to have to get to the place where we can discern something that looks so real and it isn't. I mean, it's going to look so real, sound so real. Two days ago, uh, China unveiled that their newscaster had just done 70 newscasts on state TV, and it was a human-like robot that looked just like him, and nobody knew the difference. You can Google it. And then they showed the picture of the, of the real newscaster next to the robot, even had his mannerisms. Do you see why there's so many opinions out there, but we have got to hear God speaking to us personally, personally. And when you hear that voice, obey it. Respond immediately. I'll just finish this because it's finish is good. If your spirit burns with light, fully illuminated, with no trace of darkness, you will be a shining lamp reflecting ways of truth by the way you live. Not by your religious protocol, by the way you live. Just, Lord, I want this. I want to hear your voice. Just tell them right now. You tell them. I can't tell them for you. I want to hear your voice, God. I want to hear your voice. I want to believe it. I want to walk in your ways, God. Fill me with light. Let my lamp be burning. Above all else, Lord, we want to hear you. We want an intimate relationship. Let us feel your love. Let us feel your power surrounding us your compassion, all the things that you exhibited when you were here on earth in a human body. Let us feel it, God. So I bless you today. This is the word of the Lord. It's the word of the Lord. And I'm as shocked as you, probably, at what he said. But this is the word of the Lord. And I decree over you that there is a new intimacy with God, that you will find your time of tryst with him, that you will find that time of intimacy, and that nothing will prevent you from that. Nothing will prevent you from that. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. We're friends. Um, so 
I asked Cheryl if I could just share one last verse on top of that or section of scripture. So forgive me if you think I'm trying to re-preach her message. I'm not. But that was the word of the Lord. Man. And uh, maybe your homework could just be to look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, and it's, let's stick with the passion, okay? If you could throw that up there, start with verse 7. 6, sorry, start with verse 6. Um, again, I'm only trying to help maybe give you one more dimension of that Mount of Transfiguration that is very pertinent to what we need right now. If you go back and listen to Chuck, when Chuck Pierce was here, he also said that China has another gift, quote-unquote, waiting for us. So another round of virus is, is how I took it. Uh, you know, I don't want to speak for him, but I don't think anybody would be surprised by that. So in, at the end of verse uh, 6, he says, Our ministry is not based on the letter of the law, but through the power of the Spirit. Everybody here have the power of the Spirit in you? Yes. It says if you're a Christian, you had to say that. The only way you could say Jesus is Lord is by the Spirit. Maybe you haven't actually spoken in tongues yet, but it doesn't mean you don't have the Spirit. That's our version of how to read that. Speaking in tongues is not the only evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. Saying Jesus is Lord is evidence that you have Holy Spirit. We want you to speak in tongues because then you're talking to God, like I said. But this next part says the letter of the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. That's religion. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Even the ministry that was characterized by chiseled letters of stone on tablets came with a, me came with a measure, dazzling, dazzling measure of glory, though it produced death. The Israelites couldn't bear to gaze on the glowing face of Moses because of the radiant splendor shining from his countenance. Note, a glory destined to fade away. People didn't keep the glory in those days. It would even say that of Samson that the Spirit of God came upon him and he did great exploits, but then it left. David, clearly filled with the Spirit, lingered when he looked over that roof. He didn't see the Father doing that. Yet how much more? You just say that. How much more? How much more radiant? is this new glorious ministry of the Spirit that shines from us. Oh, it's in you. That same glory that they saw is now in you and me. This is very convicting. <laughs> For if the former ministry of condemnation was ushered in with a measure of glory, how much more does the ministry that imparts righteousness far excel in glory? What once was glorious no longer holds any glory because of the increasingly greater glory that has replaced it. The greater glory of Jesus has replaced it. The fading ministry came with a portion of glory, but now we embrace the unfading ministry of a permanent impartation of glory. So then this with this amazing hope living in us, we step out in freedom and boldness to speak the truth. We're not like Moses, who used a veil to hide the glory, to keep the Israelites from staring at him as it faded away. I'm just going to be real practical here. If you're on a prayer line and somebody pushes you down, that's not God, <laughs> okay? That's fading glory, okay? That, that's what I'm talking about. We, we forget that this is a holy thing. This is an altar. And if the person's going to go down under the Spirit, God doesn't need your help to push them down. It's just a very human thing that happens. I don't mean to pick on anybody, but that's trying too hard. That's not the glory of God. Sorry, I don't mean to offend anybody. Verse 14 says, their minds were closed and hardened, and Cheryl would have said, by religion, and I would agree. Religion closes your mind and makes you a rule follower. And Jack Frost said, you can either be a lover of the law, or you can live by the law of love. And 
Jesus lived by the law of love. The lover of the law, man, you cannot win that game. That's why everybody's getting canceled today in this culture, because you can't live without some flaw, and they get to call you out on it. They're going to have their turn, Governor Cuomo. Sorry, man. He specifically said, this was not God. We did this. Look out, man. Step away from that guy. Whew. Their minds were closed and hardened for even to this day. That same veil comes over their minds when they hear the words from the former covenant. The veil has not yet been lifted from them, for it's only eliminated when, I'm sorry, when one is joined to the Messiah. So until now, whenever the Old Testament is being read, the same blinding comes over the heart. Stand up. We got to read this together. Oh, this is so good. Thank you, Brian Simmons, for the Passion Translation. <laughs> but the moment one turns to the Lord, how many turn to the Lord in here? And how many bear witness that it was like a light went on inside of you? So if there's somebody here who's visiting and, and that has never happened to you yet, there's a whole bunch of witnesses down here saying, this is real. This is real. It's like a light comes on inside and so many things just fall into place in your mind that now makes sense that didn't make sense when your mind was closed off. It's just a miracle that he could do that. Huh. So until now, whenever the Old Testament is read, the blinding comes over their hearts. But the moment one turns to the Lord with an open heart, the veil is lifted and they see. Now, the Lord I'm referring to, this is Brian Simmons' translation, is the Holy Spirit. And wherever he is Lord, there is freedom. How about this? How about this model? In the Old Testament, Moses goes up to the mountain and comes down with the law. In the New Testament, on Pentecost, the same holiday, Jesus goes up, down comes the Holy Spirit. Better than the law. It's all symbolic. Verse 18, we can all draw close to him with the veil removed from our faces. And with no veil, we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured. Same word, Mount of Transfiguration. We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. Doesn't just happen automatically, though. Not magic. Fast and pray. This kind of devil, this kind of unbelief comes out through fasting and prayer. Anything that's worth having is going to have a cost. Okay? We're not entitled to him just giving it to us. We press in, we pray. I mean, if I had a record of how many times Trisha said, what did God say? I don't want to know your opinion. What did God say? I'd be like, well, I don't know. I haven't asked. Who did I marry? I thought you were a Christian. <laughs> right, I'm being honest. She helped me a lot, man. Really. After saying yes to Jesus, that was my best decision. This glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Can you just put your hand on your heart, please? Because we think our mind is the place. It's not. It's the heart. This is where the issues of life, right here, it's our heart. We, we don't give it enough credit. And don't follow your heart. Follow the Lord, right? You'll end up in a ditch. But this is where it's all decided, right? It starts in the heart. Worship starts in the heart. He's looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth because the letter of the law will just kill us. It's not about following rules. But look, I'm just going to be honest. The only way to get to that greater level of glory is to die to something in you that's slowing you down. It's not a bad thing to be crucified. It's not a bad thing to crucify the part of your flesh. You know, if the balloon wants to go higher, it's got to get rid of some of the baggage. It's got to get a, a hotter flame going up into that balloon. Who wants to stay down on the earth? We want to go higher in him. That's what Trisha was saying. I want to take you higher. Not Sly and the Family Stone, but... Man, the view is just so much better, right? The view is just so much better. So can we lift our hand, one hand on the heart and one hand up and just say, Lord, I want to go higher in you. 
Give me the courage to put to death whatever's slowing me down from going higher in you. Give me the courage to face that fear, to face that that demon that's trying to stop me from knowing you so that I could see you more clearly and know that, like John said yesterday, you're a loving father. We break that bastard curse over America, over the world right now, that orphan spirit that tries to convince us that God's a liar. We know you are true and the devil is a liar. And Lord, we're not afraid to face the cross because we have your spirit in us and you are not afraid to face the cross. We don't want to live with that, that, res, that, that guilt that comes when we, we realize we missed the day of our visitation. We want to step through every open door that you give us, not by our might and power, but by your spirit working inside of us. Lord, thank you for Cheryl. Thank you for her patience to wait before you and hear this word today that we would really take it to heart and not just write more notes in our notebook, but that we would be convicted, like Trisha said also, not to play games, but to get down on our face and repent where we've gone wrong and ask you to forgive us and move us higher in you. We want to be transformed into your image, Lord, with ever-increasing glory. Let it happen. Let's give the Lord a hand for a word of God that came forth today. I just, I don't want to end without at least offering somebody a chance, if you don't know the Lord, to receive the Lord. It's not real complicated, to be honest. The Bible gives us one scene that's very easy. It's when Jesus is crucified, there's a thief right next to him on the cross. Never been to church, never read the Bible, none of the things we consider religious. He made a decision in his heart. And if you want to know the Lord, make a decision in your heart and just say, yes, that's me. I want to know the Lord. I want to know everything that you talked about today. I want to know it on a personal level. If it's not somebody here, maybe it's somebody at home right now. Everybody here is a Christian. Start bringing some unbelievers to church. <laughs> it's good news. They're going to like it. If it's somebody at home, just say this prayer. Heavenly Father, so come into my heart right now. I'll let you invade my space and turn that light on that I heard about today. Give me revelation of who you are and forgive me for who I've been. I want a fresh start. I need to be forgiven of my sins. And I accept the punishment Jesus took on my behalf to purchase my freedom. Lord, be the Lord of my life. Empower me through your spirit and the truth of your word to follow you the rest of my life and to spend eternity with you in Jesus name go ahead please Cheryl I have one more declaration to make over you I declare that every one of you will hear the Lord knocking on the door of your heart this week to come in and sup with you in intimate fellowship personally And now make the other declaration. I will hear the voice of the Lord 24-7, even when I'm sleeping. He'll speak to me in my dreams. Everything I do will be directed by God. Amen. God bless you. Love you all.